up. Good evening, happy Thursday. Welcome to the uh, July the 2nd Public School Board Education meeting. Uh, Ms. Lister, will you call the roll? Yeah. Reverend Williams. Here. Dr. Mickelson is absent. Dr. Morrison. Dr. Morrison. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Mrs. Bowley. Mr. Munoz. Mrs. Stuart Campbell. Dr. Bonebreak. Thank you. Okay, nice item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. I hand this to Bowley. In favor? Motion carries unanimously. We have school of highlights. Any public communications? Okay. This time, the chair will entertain a motion for business by consent. Motion, is there a second? Any discussion? Ready for the vote? All right, the vote is open. All votes are in. Motion carries unanimously. So, Reverend Williams, I just uh, want you to know that I have not been able to hear the motions or the second. So either they're not on a microphone or I have something wrong here. I hear you fine. Okay, I think we discovered the problem. <laughs> This time we move on to the superintendent's report. Good 
afternoon. Now, it's so wonderful to have a board member on the other side testing this all out. Dr. Morrison, can you hear me clearly at this time? I certainly can. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so as we uh, prepare to proceed, uh, we're going to start off with our summer school update. And um, Mrs. Uh, Lauren, uh, I'm sorry, I almost said Lauren Peel, Mrs. Carrie Ritter, and uh, Mrs. Wallace. I've had a wonderful time with our summer school. And so the first uh, uh, two minutes, uh, uh, she wants to give a little update as summer school is still winding down, but Ms. Ritter has done a phenomenal job. She is an administrator at Randolph Elementary Normal through the school year and over the summer. This is her summer really solo running the summer program and this is our first summer with an enrichment program. So I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Carrie Ritter. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Um, in about a week we'll be wrapping up our fourth year of summer enrichment. This program has grown more and more as the years have gone by both in the number of students participating, as well as in the number of classes being offered. You can switch to the first slide. So you'll notice that we began this program in 2017, and I just want you to note down at the bottom, and I'm gonna talk about that here, our growth. Um, we began planning for our program back in January. We had brochures and flyers that went home to students right before spring break, and then COVID happened. Um, within just a few days, we completely scrapped our plans and recreated an entirely new virtual summer enrichment program. And we had teachers coming through with really creative learning opportunities for our students. So by the time our planning was finished, we had a total of 38 different classes for students and 66 teachers participating. We had a website with the courses listed by week, um, descriptions of those classes, and a registration form that was included on the website. Within a week of our registration going live, we received nearly 400 registration forms. And by the time it was all over, we had 500 individual students registered with 69 of those students being from outside districts. And you'll note on the next slide, our average attendance. Each week we had an average attendance of about 300 students, not including this week and next week as we're wrapping up. You can go to the next slide. We were able to offer students a wide variety of courses. We had art programs for every grade level, um, we were even able to provide art materials for students prior to camp beginning. We actually made 140 porch drops to deliver art materials to students that were participating. We had science classes, forensic science, space exploration, engineering, um, home experiments. We had technology in the form of coding and Google certification. We offered six different book clubs, math camps at all levels, eight different foreign language opportunities, and we had music and fitness classes for all students. And being online offered many of our classes the opportunity to have guest speakers. Um, the theater club had a Broadway actor on to speak with the kids. The art club had two local artists. Um, they had virtual field trips where they got to visit the Colosseum in Rome, the pyramids in Egypt, a rainforest, a crime lab, and even Disney World, among many other things. Many of these courses, you'll see pictures here, um, were such a unique learning opportunity for kids and so wildly popular that we'll be definitely including them again next year. And um, I would conclude that despite our program being entirely virtual this summer, it was, we maintained very high levels of interest and large numbers of students participating. So it was, it was a different experience and a fun one. Thank you. 
congratulations for Miss Ritter. She has done an amazing job. And for board members to know, we're going to be giving a virtual summer programming every year moving forward. Um, we'll still have in-person uh, summer school. We uh, uh, look forward to that returning. But we'll be providing some level of virtual connection as well as many of our families enjoyed the one, the free programming and being able to access programming without having to drive anywhere. So we'll be still doing that in some fashion. Any questions for Ms. Ritter before we proceed on? Yeah. Reverend, I think, oh, go ahead. I think it's fabulous. I was kind of interested in maybe attending some of them, but I wonder, there were 500 signed up and 250 or so participated. Did all 500 participate to some degree? Yes, in some capacity. And actually, it's really hard to pinpoint each week, but students were able to sign up for multiple classes. So even though we say it's 500 individual students, each week we had numbers in the upwards of 1,000 because they could sign up for as many as they wanted, if that makes sense. So Reverend Williams, um, uh, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. One, um, there was an, an attrition rate, uh, Ms. Ritter. Um, do, do you um, do you kind of understand where that and is is the attrition rate going to continue through four and five? Um, I I for what do you mean four and for the years? Week, week four and five. Oh, week four and five. Um, honestly, I think our numbers are are sliding a little bit towards the end because people are uh, out enjoying their summers a little bit more as things opened up. So. Um, the numbers have dropped just a little and our classes dropped. We went from 27 classes offered last week to these last two weeks are just about seven or eight. Okay. We're typically done by now. So, uh, I mean, you, you should be, uh, I think it's quite amazing that you were able to shift gears in the middle of the uh, semester and, and uh, come up with a virtual plan. One other question uh, I'm curious about, and only because I've, uh, I have a, my stepdaughter's here from California and she asked a question of how did you virtually do a physical education program? Um, that one was unique. We had different levels. We had elementary, middle school and high school. And what they did was two of them met on Zoom. And so we gave out a Zoom link and they did live classes with kids but the others filmed their workouts or their program. And then we posted that video to the website so that people could access it at any time throughout the weeks. So the teachers posted it. Yeah. And, and then, uh, uh, and then the kids could do it anytime. Uh, yeah. Oh, very good. That's yeah. Well, congratulations. It, it, it looks like a fun program. Thank you. I, I do want to say it took a lot of people in, in that week to make all of this happen. So thank you to all of them as well. I believe we had that open to uh, students outside our district. Is that correct? Correct. How many do we have that uh, enrolled that might have been outside the district? Do you have those numbers? There were 69. And did they stay with us? Did they, uh, do, do we know if they, their attendance continued with us throughout the program? They did, and I happen to know one of them. Um, she knew my daughter and they were in the Seaman District and I swear she must have shared with every friend she had because then they all <laughs> started asking. So um, a lot of the families from outside our district actually you know, share the word a lot because no other district is offering anything like this and they want everyone to participate and parents were excited that it was an option. I love the number 69. That's really nice to have so many students come in to experience our district. What do you think we learned from attendance and uh, staying with the program that we might be able to look at if we have to go online for school again? Um, you know, I think I will say one of the things we learned in person um, was, you know, when we added a deposit fee, it really kind of held people accountable. Um, I will say that some of the struggle with this was that it was free, which was great, 
um, but it, you know, large numbers of people signed up for classes and that didn't necessarily equate to exactly how many were attending each week. So I would like to, to figure out how we can um, kind of tie some accountability into these people attending. But also I think we've learned that, you know, I personally have learned that we have some really creative teachers out there who have these really awesome ideas and I already said, okay, I want you next year. I want to do this with our families again because we wouldn't have offered them ordinarily. Um, they weren't on our original class list, but I think they absolutely need to be. And, I, and like Dr. Anderson said, I don't think it will be difficult to do a hybrid of in-person and continuing with some of these virtual classes. Congratulations to you and the whole team. I'm glad it was a successful first year for you. That's wonderful. And thank you. Uh, please thank them all for us here on the board that all their efforts they put in and continuing to make a uh, public school shine. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nemios. Thank you. You know, um, first off, I wanted to say that my my kids are part of that program, and so uh, every day they came, I came home, they showed me something different, something new that they learned. And so I thought, I just wanted to say that whoever the, these teachers were were amazing, just from from the feedback I got from my kids. So I just wanted to give kudos to those teachers who use creativity to get our kids interested in, in continuing to learn. Um, you know, I, one question that comes to mind for me is how can how can we use the creativity from from teachers and in this online medium to address some of the inequities and, and, and keep our kids on pace to learning. I think that's one of the biggest concerns for me when it comes to the summer is I, I don't want to lose any of the progress that our teachers have made during school time. And so how do you how do you see um, being more creative in terms of, of the topics that, that we can use to engage kids and have them continue to be interested in learning? Yes, and I, and I will say since we added virtual, um, we were able to tie in a lot more of the academic piece in a fun way. You know, we had math camps that ran from week one to week six. They'll finish next week and at every grade level. And in an effort to address those standards that we notoriously test low in, but to review those skills in ways that make kids love it and enjoy it and have fun with it. So um, I think this has been a great opportunity to see that we can address all of those academic skills um, in unique ways and make it fun for kids. Just notice uh, these numbers as they increase every year, I, my hope is that more and more kids each year learn about this, the parents learn about these programs, especially right now, there are so few ways for parents to get kids engaged just because of the limitations of where they can and can't go. That programs like this are really important and could do a lot of good. So thank you for all your work. Thank you very much. Are we paying the teachers? Yes, sir. And we have a lot of teachers. <laughs> I I just want to thank you also and congratulate you. Like Mr. Munoz, both my children participated in the summer enrichment program. Um, and yeah, so we were recipients of art supplies on our porch. So thank you very much for that. So they both attended the um, two of the art classes. And my daughter participated in two weeks of theater. She she would really be embarrassed if she knew I was like saying a group of people. She, I, she's going to be a sixth grader. Um, she loved it so much. She actually cried when it was over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I reached out to Miss Graham and I told her I'm like you and the I don't remember the man's name at Topeka West did such a great job that my daughter actually cried. She was so sad it was over. Anyway, and uh, she's now enrolled in French, and I was kind of lurking in the background because it's interesting. And, uh, and also that teacher is doing a great job using Pear Deck. I'm like, ooh, I want to learn how to do this. Like, it just makes it so much more engaging. So anyway, just good job. 
my, my children have really benefited. Thank you. I, I'm going to throw it out there too. My daughter participated in art club. She's the little one on the bottom left, not so little, but um, same. She, she learned some things that she had never done before. In fact, that picture is using oil pastels and now she's signed up for art next year, which she's really excited about. So it is very unique and, and a great opportunity for kids. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Uh, Carrie, thank you and your uh, team for a job well done. Thank you, sir. Point of personal privilege. Please tell your dad I said hello. <laughs> I will. <laughs> So with that summer school uh, report and summer programming report, I will share with you, if you recall, three years ago, and I think it's been, been three years now, Ms. Weller? Three years ago, you know, uh, four years ago, we didn't have a summer program in Topeka Public Schools. So three years ago, um, I asked that we started and asked Ms. Wallace to really take this under the teaching and learning belt. And it has just grown rapidly under that. So the last couple of years, uh, Erin McCoy, who I reference as the real McCoy, I happened to see her teaching uh, so creatively. I asked her to take charge of the summer program prior to her being a principal. So she really got that started uh, and has continued and then she uh, sh had Mrs. Ritter shadow her last year and Miss Ritter solo this year has just uh, taken uh, another approach with the virtual piece and it has really been uh, unique. With that being said, uh, the question about uh, engagement and creativity that we see for the summer rolling over into the school year Ms. Wallace uh, is the one that introduced the Pear Deck pieces through her staff to begin to utilize that. And we have professional development prepared for the beginning of the year for that. Many of the things that were done this summer, we have that embedded in our professional development because there's no reason to stop at the summer with what we've learned virtually. So some of the training that we'll be giving is how do you engage young people virtually um, and how do you use tools even in the classroom that are technology future ready tools to further engage young people. Because even if they're in the classroom, some of these things can be done in the classroom, many of these. Um, the piece of the um, porch drops, Mrs. Wallace's uh, you know, team and the fine arts team decided to drop off, was it 100? Uh, 140 porch drops, so every parent receives supplies. This is how that will change. Uh, our uh, communication specialist, Molly Hackett, and others uh, in the police department have their drones licensed, so the drones will be doing drop-offs in the future. Um, so we're excited about uh, piloting that as soon as uh, we are released to be able to do that, uh, certainly this time next year. So we're, we're excited about that. So with that summer programming, Ms. Wallace, is there any other wrap-up statement you'd like to make since it falls under teaching and learning? I would just share that the engagement piece is huge. Um, and, and a piece of that is creating um, interconnectivity or integrated units. I mean, we really worked with them and asked the teachers um, what they wanted to teach. And that was a big chunk of it is they all had real passion about the topics that they chose to teach and then um, to cre create those integrated units. So Mrs. Uh, Ritter, who is an administrative intern, this also gives her some experience over the summer for about six to eight weeks to uh, you know, serve in a larger administrative capacity as an intern to be able to really expand her ability to monitor and grow that. So we are impressed with her and the program. Again, thank you, Ms. Ritter and Ms. Wallace. So summer programming is the topic as we roll into strategic planning. Before we move off of summer program, we have a couple other summer items. Uh, first, I do want to say that as Mr. Kathy comes in, he has his microphone, he's gonna stand in front of the camera. Uh, to give a summer update regarding uh, leagues and summer programming, athletic summer programming and leagues, not quite summer school or summer enrichment. As Mr. Kathy comes closer to Mrs. Um, uh, to the screen uh, and prepares to give that update, uh, we have uh, a couple of other updates. Now, Mr. Kathy is the new principal of Topeka West, uh, formerly an AD in the district and an associate principal. He's now still AD, so he's uh, assistant. He's now the principal of Topeka West and uh, the athletic director uh, moving into the spot that Mr. Dick 
previously had overseeing all of athletics. We are so proud of this young man. He's been at Topeka West for eight years. Uh, that little stall gave us time to get him properly situated on the camera. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cappy, and then we'll uh, give one additional announcement and go straight into our strategic plan. High school is uh, requesting or would like to take an opportunity to look at um, exploring the possibility of moving into a new or a different athletic league. Um, moving in the future, similar to what Topeka West and Highland Park have both recently done. Um, with this, uh, the school, we have, there are three schools slated to leave the Centennial League with rumors of three or four others possibly leaving. Uh, so um, at this time, this creates a concern that the league uh, may disband at some point in time. And uh, our concern would be that if we do not take this opportunity, if we do take this opportunity, uh, we'd be able to explore options for Topeka High School to ensure uh, they can find a league that provides their students um, with, uh, with an equitable op opportunity to compete with all the programs as it is and uh, maintain a competitive environment moving forward. So in the past for the board, we share with you before we uh, prepare to look at other leagues uh, and just make sure there's a consensus of support. Uh, it's not a voted item, but it's an item that during the summer months, Topeka High wants to proceed, but before we allow them to proceed with giving notice that two years from now, they'd like to go to the Sunshine League. Um, prior to doing that, that we have shared with the board the issue and the a plan to look at another league uh, prior to the current league folding. Uh, are there questions about that for Mr. Kathy? Um, by the way, it's Sunflower League. I said mm -hmm. sunshine. I'm telling you, maybe that's just all the energy in this room, sunflower. And I should know that for the state of Kansas. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. I'm glad you're paying attention. So uh, what, what uh, other schools are in the Sunflower League? Uh, is that the Lawrence schools, et cetera? Lawrence, um, Overland Park, and uh, Olathe are currently the schools in that league. So how many Olathe schools, three or four? Uh, currently the uh, Sunflower League has 15 schools. Uh, wow. in So if there are no, uh, you know, concerns or questions, uh, uh, we will uh, let Ms. Morrissey know she can proceed. How many are left in the Centennial League? Um, currently, there are, if, let's see, with three leaving, we are at, uh, and, uh, it would be six, and then if Topeka hired to leave, it would be five left in the league, and four, by, by the way the state's set up, there are four teams it takes to make up a league, and the concern is, is that if the other the other three or four teams that are rumored to be looking also leave that Topeka High would be left with no league at all. Um, so we want to make sure they have an opportunity to explore leagues before they get into the point of you don't have a league, so now you have to go find competition of non-league schools. Our area schools will still compete against each other as well, even though they're in different leagues? Yes, that is uh, one thing that we are looking to make sure we're able to maintain is uh, in the non-league com competition is that our district schools are able to compete against each other. Daniel? What, um, what calls your attention to this particular league as opposed to others? Why this one? Uh, it's made up of larger schools. Um, their participation uh, of sports, so they, they're able to maintain three, uh, uh, three levels of athletics in each of the sports that they compete in. They compete in the same sports that the high currently competes in. Our students wouldn't be stuck in a place where we have a number of kids that can play freshmen but not able to find team, freshman teams. Colin. Behind you. Is it not correct? Didn't you pick the hobby of belong to the Sunfire League back in the 70s, 60s and 70s? I don't know the answer. I know they were in the I 70 League. I'm not to answer that question, honestly, is I do not know. It seemed like if the one that used to come to Topeka High on the Topeka regularly in basketball and dominate, that's why I asked. I think that, yeah, because the Shawnee Mission, well, the local Olathe schools were part of a different league at that time. I have to look into that some more and get you an answer. Be kind of going back home. 
And with that, uh, if there are no other questions, and again, my apologies, the Sunflower League is a league that they're looking at. But at this point, they will be uh, sharing that they are exploring so that they can prepare accordingly before uh, needing a league in a couple of years. Uh, we thank Mr. Kathy for coming. Uh, as Mr. Kathy has taken on the athletic director role, thank you, Mr. Kathy. Uh, as Mr. Kathy has taken on the uh, athletic director role, as you may know, uh, you have a couple of items at your uh, table. This is another summer programming activity and it's graduation. Uh, previously, Mr. Dick was uh, leading uh, secondary schools uh, in your um, voting this evening. You have voted on how to continue this work, uh, not only for that, but also our equity work. So we'll give that announcement, but let me share with you what's in front of you. Graduation is July the 25th. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my past districts is to give a senior salute. And so I thought this might be a new tradition for uh, Topeka Public Schools to be an extra piece that every student receives at graduation. So we have created, you right now have Topeka West, and this actually will be printed as a magazine, but we printed these off in paper copy for you to see. Uh, so as a sample, every family will receive the senior salute, which has every student's photo in it. Uh, and um, this will just uh, be a memory from this year. Uh, additionally, uh, every family will, when the student crosses the stage, will receive, if they didn't get their diploma, uh, their diploma. Uh, if they did get their diploma, then any other items, awards, and even some letters, personal letters that some schools are putting inside of the packets. So when students uh, come into the Hummer Stadium on July 25th, they will cross the stage, uh, pick up their packet, and uh, have the opportunity to take their photo with the Grad Images uh, photographers. And uh, we have those scheduled out and posted on our website. So all three high schools on July 25th, starting at 9.30 with Topeka High, will be prepared for that ceremony. Every uh, board member has a ticket. Because we are keeping the numbers at 2,000 or below, every family this year will need a ticket to enter. Uh, the tickets have now been printed. The parents have received letters from their principals that they can pick up their tickets uh, from the school and uh, those families will use those to enter. The staff that are not at the school that might be at different schools like elementary staff or social workers at other schools that have seen students matriculate, they also can contact the principal and get a ticket and they will be allowed to enter in that fashion. Uh, are there questions about the upcoming uh, ceremony? If there are not any questions, Mrs. Uh, Lister, if you have not gotten your gown, we do ask that this year you come with your gown in hand, as the students will, as opposed to preparing at the stadium. Ms. Lister can make sure that you receive that prior to that um, graduation ceremony. And the hospitality room will be set up for the board should you want that in the air conditioning uh, throughout the course of the morning. Uh, we anticipate that each ceremony will be abbreviated, so there will not be speeches. Rather, we really are focused on celebrating the students and letting them cross the stage and having the photo. So the ceremonies will probably conclude within one hour, and there will be an hour transition time before the next group comes. All right, we're excited about that. If it does rain, we will have the ceremony the next day. The other item uh, in your packet that you have received, uh, we are so excited uh, this summer. Uh, we thought this might be neat with four board members that people get the chance to really get to know you a little bit better through video. So I believe Mr. Munoz's video has already been done and it was just a big hit. And so with that video, we'll be uh, uh, videoing, I believe you're next on the list, Mr. Campbell, and we just go straight down from there. So you're going to get an invitation from the communications team saying that you are a rock star. Each of you will get that. And then the board members that have been on the board for a long time, you are an older rock star. And, uh, they will video you as the final board members being featured, and this will be the feature for the summer. Over the summer, we don't have a lot of instructional programming to feature on our cable channel, and we want to make sure we have fresh, fresh um, information for our families. So the flyer is really uh, for you, and this is... Uh, Mrs. Molly Hackett will be reaching out to you to videotape you and just talk to you and interview you and have that as one of our videos uh, throughout the rest of this summer. 
So I look forward to that. In terms of the final summer programming opportunities, uh, we will talk about in our COVID plan, uh, but our uh, parents will be gathering feedback this summer on Monday and on Tuesday. And for those that are interested in the DCAC, it is on Tuesday night. So our DCAC parents will be facilitating communication and uh, you have the flyer, I believe, at your table of what that looks like in terms of what has been posted this evening for those feedback sessions. Our teachers will also be given that opportunity. We still have quite the robust summer ahead of us. So with that, uh, we're going to slide right into the strategic plan. Under the strategic plan, uh, Mr. Dick, as I mentioned, uh, was the lead uh, high school uh, principal and at one point the year prior lead secondary. You uh, may recall that Cross and Joptis uh, did a needs assessment uh, some years ago and suggested that we have an associate superintendent. Uh, we have uh, now when the uh, consent agenda you have approved, while it is a couple of years now later, you have now approved the associate superintendent, so I do want to acknowledge her as she is observing in the room today. She will oversee the secondary schools as suggested in the Cross and Joftis report. Uh, she is familiar with year-round schools from North Kansas City, and so she will help us explore all kinds of creative opportunities to uh, manage uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and equitable resources uh, across uh, Topeka. Just to mention uh, very briefly, uh, her bio will be on the uh, website now that you have approved uh, Dr. Jill Hackett. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Jill Hackett to stand at this time, and she's not on camera, so nobody can see her but the board. Uh, but for those that can't see her, um, Dr. Jill Hackett uh, is, uh, has been a superintendent, a deputy superintendent, uh, and an assistant superintendent, and most importantly, a 15-year teacher in Topeka Public Schools. So she is coming back home. Uh, and if she had, if she was on camera or in front of a microphone, she would likely uh, say hello. But I'll stop for just a moment, since board members, you all can see her. Not that this is a crowded room. But with acknowledgement of Dr. Hackett, we are excited about her expertise and knowledge joining. Uh, Dr. Hackett right now is an international trainer and she trains uh, many of the administrators across Blue Valley School District and I think she has six other maybe school districts or so that she trains uh, regularly throughout the week. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, all the needs for high school continue without missing a beat uh, as we move forward in this COVID uh, uh, crisis. Now we're going to talk about uh, this COVID reopening plan. I want to remind all families uh, that are listening and staff that the reopen plan uh, officially cannot be released until uh, the State Department and the Health Department have released their plans. But we do have uh, many things that we can share with you because our team has already provided a great deal of information uh, and has been planning all summer uh, of how we will continue services in some fashion throughout the upcoming year, but we are waiting to move forward until we receive uh, the remaining uh, documents that we need to to publish our plan. In order to be ready for teachers, uh, which is the last week of July, we need to make sure that we have a plan that's ready to be published, we hope, by July 13th. Therefore, our team has been planning since the last day of school. Uh, and I, we're going to go through uh, a variety of pieces with various voices. So Mrs. Sharp is here and Dr. Gray both will be coming forward. I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Sharp with the microphone who will stand right in front of the camera. Uh, and she's going to just share a little bit about who is on our team. And Dr. Gray is coming forward as well to the podium and he will then take the uh, microphone shortly. But we'll start off with Mrs. Sharp and Ms. Wallace and go from there. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. It's nice to see everyone today. Um, our committee has been meeting um, on and off over the last couple of weeks, like Dr. Anderson shared. Um, she, of course, is leading our charge with our reopening of schools planning, along with um, Mr. Robbins, our Deputy Superintendent of Schools, and Ms. Wallace, our Assistant Superintendent. 
um, to teach or to bring teaching and learning um, to the team. We have um, Ms. Sherrielle De La Cruz. Um, she is the secondary math consulting teacher and she also teaches at Highland Park High School. We have Ms. Diane Kenzie, who is also a math consulting teacher. Mary Casey is the secondary ELA consulting teacher. Ms. Robin Dixon is the elementary ELA consulting teacher. And we have Dr. Pilar Mejia, who is the principal at Scott Dual Language Magnet School. We have uh, Mr. Travis True, who is an instructional technology specialist. Amy Glinka is a third grade teacher at McEachern Elementary School. We have Ms. Ann Gorsuch, who is the assistant principal at Scott Dual Language Magnet. Ms. Mallory Jacobs is the counselor at Whitson Elementary School. We have Megan Geyser and Michelle Seidner, who are representing the special education department. Ms. Catherine Risley, one of our school improvement specialists, has been really leading the charge as well. With Ms. Lori Vodder, our coordinator of health services, giving input, and of course, um, Dr. Gray on the team to help with the communication aspect. And I am going to turn it over now to Ms. Wallace. Thank you. Um, good evening. We have had the pleasure of having several of Topeka Public Schools staff serve on various KSDE um, reopening committees. It's Navigating Change is the name of their committees. Um, I had the honor of serving on the Oversight Committee, kind of pulling things together from both the implementation and the operations team. Um, Ms. Della Cruz and Ms. Mallory Jacobs are on the implement implementation teams. Um, Ms. Gorsuch was on the operations team, and Ms. Pilar, or Dr. Pilar Mejia and um, Amy Glinka are on the Phase 3 professional development team, and Phase 3 really just kicked off this week. Our timeline, uh, we want to walk you through. Again, this document is intended to give general information about planning and what's ahead and some components that we have in place. And the full team here tonight will answer questions. Just to remind everyone, March when we first went into our COVID uh, uh, closure, uh, we uh, began a COVID-19 response team and that team began planning of how can we immediately open up schools and restructuring the curriculum. In April and in May, we began to expand the virtual school option and we applied to have elementary uh, as a virtual school option. For grades 3 through 5, we already have virtual school in grades 6 through 12. And in May, parent surveys regarding who would like to access virtual school was given. We now have uh, a number of uh, families. Uh, 396 pre-K through 5 and 366 6 through 12 shared that if we reopen, they would like to be in virtual in some form, most of which fully virtual uh, at this time. So we certainly have uh, over 600 families that are interested in that choice. Now that we know that, we also can better identify staff to help uh, support those families. The virtual summer school began on June 1st. And then our Head Start on-site preschooling, uh, the planning for that began on the 22nd, and Ms. Sharp has shared that on-site preschool actual registration will start next week. On July 2nd, the board meeting, uh, the school board meeting, which is today, is occurring to really look at the strategic plan. And our focus under this plan is really about reopening at this time until we reopen. The strategic plan discussions are shifted to that. So July 3rd, uh, which uh, this week, based on the virtual school enrollment needs and the June registration, based on what we know at this time about the pandemic, which we do not know the health department guidelines yet. We thought we might know that by this time, but we don't. However, based on what we do know from the CDC and the information in Topeka, uh, we will be issuing a survey to our families and our staff to uh, really assess the degree of comfortability uh, in a variety of areas. That survey, Mr. Gowan, do you have that from Mr. Kipp? That survey we have here this evening, and I will pause for just a moment uh, to pull that survey up. 
That survey will be emailed to each of the board members. And I just ask for your feedback as you look at the 10 or so questions, because this evening it'll be hard to look at that and give questions. But to give you a glimpse of what kinds of things we'll be asking, uh, some of the questions that we will be asking uh, start off with if they're a parent or a teacher. And we know that many of our teachers are parents. So they'll uh, share that piece. If they are a parent and they would like to give their child's name, that's going to be optional. Because if their child needs a new device or doesn't have a device, we also will be asking that. But other questions that we have list uh, include uh, things like asking if they their degree of comfortability with uh, any of the options of either being 100% virtual or partial day virtual or having um, smaller class sizes uh, or having one-on-one. -on -one. So there are a variety of options mentioned in that survey. And we're really asking how comfortable families are with any of those options. Uh, the survey is still relatively short. Uh, we, if you go all the way to the very bottom, I think there are about 10 or 11 questions. So you can fill it out relatively quickly. We have not sent this survey out yet because we wanted first the DCAC and the school board's feedback on the survey. Uh, how friendly is it? Uh, is it something that, are there any questions that we left off without making this too long? DCAC has given their feedback and we have revised the survey accordingly. Uh, so we uh, asked for the school board to give us their feedback. And once you do that, then we will be able to issue the survey. If we receive feedback this evening via electronically or tomorrow, we will uh, send the survey out uh, Friday. You don't necessarily have to rush because SurveyMonkey has shared that nationally they will be going down for the holiday for 12 hours. And so we can't send the survey out to Friday evening, no matter how quickly you get us your feedback. So take your time with the feedback. If you do get it back Friday and we get it from all members, if you have no feedback, if you can just email me to say you have no feedback, then I know that I've accounted for every member to share anything that you like to share with me. Okay, so that survey is one way. Now surveys generally come out electronically. We do have meal sites and we can put them at meal sites, but we have not had very good um, feedback back from people turning paper surveys and with the virus, we want to reduce the level of paper exchange. Therefore, we're having feedback verbal sessions if you would prefer not to do an online survey or if you want to do both uh, or if you don't have the internet. So by Zoom, which also has a phone number attached to it, parents can call in and give feedback. So we're having two feedback sessions, one in the morning on, uh, I'm sorry, one in the evening at 6 p.m. on Monday and one on Tuesday at 1030, all facilitated by our DCAC families. So we're excited about that for those families that need greater access to giving feedback. As we proceed on with the timeline, and at the very end, we'll entertain questions. Uh, in that timeline that we uh, just spoke about, I believe we've covered uh, much of July, but on July 7th through the 10th, the next several items include the broadband presentation by Gina Millsap to the DCAC. That's on Tuesday night. Meanwhile, that is occurring July 7th through the 10th. The Health Department and KSDE uh, will begin to uh, finalize their guidelines, and we expect by July the 10th, KSDE and the Health Department would have given us restrictions and guidelines that we can ensure our plan is aligned to allowing us to share a plan by Monday, July 13th. The 15th through the 16th, believe it or not, principals, they're so uh, excited to return, they will be back on the 15th. So the 15th through the 16th, they will receive training on the plan that we now have. Every school is being asked to have a COVID response team at their school. So they can take the parameters and guidelines and tailor it to fit their school. Their school team should include a nurse, administrators, and whoever the principal wants to include will be on that school team. Uh, that was shared as well with the health department. They like that idea so much, they're actually going to embed that in their health department suggested plan that districts may want to include a person um, at each school that has a COVID response school-based team. So how they implement the guidelines will be tailored to each school. 
on the 23rd uh, and they will receive training. The other training that uh, for you to know, Chief Brown will be offering tabletop training. Uh, so in this case, it will be examples and scenarios uh, that principals may be faced with uh, regarding the pandemic and they will have a couple of hours of training to uh, and their entire school team will have that as well to be able to walk through different exercises such as if a parent doesn't want to wear a mask if a student becomes COVID positive and we learn it while they're at school um, or uh, there are a variety of things you may be faced with okay the last two items uh, on that timeline on the 23rd uh, is enrollment. We normally have in-person enrollment and for those that might wonder why we would do that during the pandemic, some of our families do not have internet or uh, as much internet accessibility and the enrollment form is difficult to do on your telephone. So while many things can be done by the telephone, enrollment is not uh, as easy. Therefore, every principal will be trained on how to have a safe in-person enrollment for anyone that wants to come in person and enroll. Very a few parents take that option, but for those that want that option, it will be offered. We also provide trainers at that time as well. And then the last item is our high school graduation on the 25th. That's a lot in uh, the timeline within all this month. So the next slides, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Gray, who is going to come forward and share a little bit with you about the communications plan as he comes near Ms. Lister and the slides so that everyone that is Facebook living can see him. In terms of communication, can you hear me? In terms of communications and recommendations uh, that will be shared by the state on July 10th, I'm going to spend the next uh, few minutes sharing how we plan to communicate with the open plan. On July 10th, we're excited because uh, Topeka Public Schools will host the Shawnee County Superintendent's Collaboration Planning Meeting, where superintendents from around Shawnee County uh, will share their reopening plan at Bishop Elementary School, or Bishop Professional Development uh, Center. Uh, in terms of communicating the reopening plan, we are developing promotional videos that will be shared through social media such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, and on our district television station. Uh, we will also be sharing handouts and other information at our 14 summer grabbing no meal sites. We're also working alongside DCAC, as Dr. Anderson stated, uh, to host virtual feedback gathering sessions uh, for parents and educators. Uh, beginning on Monday, July 6th at 6 p.m. and also on Tuesday, July 7th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, information about our reopening plan will also be shared on our district website uh, in the form of a banner on the main page. Communication is also working alongside teaching and learning to update the COVID-19 reopening uh, website. This site will feature parent resources, student resources, educational resources, and links that would gather feedback from both teachers, parents, and students. Go to the next slide. Uh, we have also been in communication with transportation and bus routes will be set by August 3rd. Uh, they will be accessible electronically uh, for parents uh, via Tyler SIS and administrators will have access to those bus routes as well uh, through Versatrain. Finally, in an effort to ensure that we have clear, consistent, and ongoing communications, the following method of communications will be used. Again, uh, C News will be utilized bi-weekly. Uh, we have our district and school websites. Uh, we have social media, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, along with Instagram. Uh, we have Blackboard Messenger, and we have the features such as email, text, and phone call. And then we have postcards, radio, uh, flowers at meal sites. We have our, our, uh, our TV station, which we call KTPS, Kansas Topeka Public Schools TV station, uh, which is Cox Cable Channel 14, as well as the news media. Uh, if you notice, you have some in white and you also have some that have been highlighted in yellow. And the reason being is because we want to make sure that we have thought uh, through those who may not have internet access. So again, with the postcards and with the radio flyers uh, at meal sites, as well as our television station and the media, uh, those are other avenues that we can utilize to make sure that everyone uh, 
that you receive in our communications. With those items, Dr. Gray has put at your table uh, learning options for families as one of the graphics that will be given to families in terms of the on-site learning, hybrid, or remote virtual learning, because we know those are the three options that we're working with. It's, uh, the plan will detail how we will work with those three options, and we'll be bringing that um, information in an ongoing fashion, although we anticipate things moving along rather rapidly because new teachers come back the last week of July. So if, as we wait for the 10th, we really will have to move forward relatively quickly. We'll be bringing um, the draft thus far of the plan. Uh, individually, if uh, board members would like to speak with me about some of those elements, we can have that conversation directly. But the full plan and the draft format or the final format uh, can't be released until after KSDE and the other uh, entities. But on-site learning, a hybrid model, and remote virtual learning are all the three options. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gowan, because what we do know is we have to have this digital equity with whatever we're rolling out. So he's going to talk about some of the digital equity aspects that have been planned out by the team. One of the challenges with uh, various forms of remote learning, whether it be the blended learning model or whether it be the learning model where students are learning from home, is that not all of our students can access the internet and can access those materials in the same ways. Um, the community has um, a responsibility to kind of level that playing field, not only for our students, but also the families that support those students. Um, we do not have a, a single broadband wireless initiative in our community, which would be able to give that kind of connectivity for our students. And so our, our challenge is to find a way for our students to connect and, and find a, a means for us to be able to support their learning. Uh, those students will benefit from research and e-learning opportunities, but keep in mind that the families will also be benefit. They'll have access to on online job searches, they'll be able to uh, receive online services, and um, also participate in telecommuting opportunities uh, if we do wind up in a situation where people need to do so again. Um, during the continuous learning model, this was during the spring of, nine, of the 1920 school year, uh, schools provided student devices um, and a map of publicly available Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, with the idea being that um, the students would have their device and either they would connect at their home or they would go to these locations which were publicly available and uh, use their devices at those locations. Uh, we provided wireless access at our school's parking lots and we noted those on the map as well. And we also um, deployed buses at some of the schools that didn't have as good of the um, wireless access in the parking lots. We deployed those buses during the day. We also purchased a limited number of hotspots for our high need students who are participating in dual credit opportunities because we didn't want the COVID-19 to interfere with their chance to get the college credits that they deserve. And so we wanted to make sure that they had that opportunity. Um, during this time, Cox Communications also provided uh, not only the reduced cost connect to commute, compete service that they have been providing for years, but they also provided um, for new for new people who signed up for it, they gave that to them free until July 15th. But in order for us to get ready for the fall, we're gonna have to do some additional things. Um, one of the things that we are doing is as soon as the Spark Grant applications become available, we will be applying for some additional CARES funds available through the county. Uh, we currently have three strategies that we would like to deploy with those additional CARES funds. One would be uh, education and support requested for broadband services. In other words, we're going to seek out an opportunity to help solve that problem with those families who cannot access our, uh, our learning materials. Um, we're also currently collaborating with community partners to expand those resources and um, perhaps get more um, community commitment to whatever initiatives we can implement for that. And then the other thing that we're looking at is technology solutions that can help um, that can help do the drone deliveries and, and other things that, that we'll need to do in order to get the supplies, for example, into the hands of our students. Um, in addition to that, the IT department is piloting, uh, piloting additional uh, outdoor wireless strategies and uh, out, outdoor wireless equipment so that we can get more of our parking lots covered as kind of a, an ongoing strategy um, for even after COVID-19 to make sure that digital equity is a priority going forward. Uh, working with Cox, uh, we're also going to work 
also going to be working with Cox in order to continue services that they've been providing to our high need families. At the digital equity slide uh, to see if there are questions. We have two more slides left, but questions about how we're going to communicate thus far the plan at once it's uh, approved and allowed to be public and our digital equity strategies that we know we will need to deploy because we will have some virtual experiences ahead. Any questions about those two slides thus far? When students or families go to the parking lot to access that wireless, are they just downloading some information and then leaving, or do they have to sit there for several hours to communicate uh, during their classes? It depends on what the uh, it depends on what their assignments are or what the instructional plan is for in each individual student. In some cases, they're downloading material and then engaging with that material offline. In other cases, they're um, they're doing like a Zoom session with their teacher. In some cases. And so, and Ms. Wallace, do you want to add to that at all? So. Um, in secondary, we use Google Classroom, and many of the things that they put in their Google Classroom and many of our textbooks can be downloaded and used offline. And then once they come back on site, it just uploads all of that information. At elementary, we're um, going to utilize Seesaw at PK through 5, and it's much the same way. Um, it will allow them to post um, videos and assignments, and there are a lot of virtual tools that they can use. Um, so that it can be more interactive and engaging. Do that from at home without the internet uh, Correct. connectivity, and then when they come back to the parking lot, that uploads it to the teachers? Correct. Any, any assignments that were completed or work that was done um, gets uploaded. And then so the only time they would need internet access would be for the live Zoom classes that they would be participating in. I think I I'm okay with this as uh, as one way to sort of help our students. Um, but I, I I see this as simply a temporary mandate for, for a larger issue, right? And I think I think really the board needs to work hard at and together with administration to make sure that uh, strengthen our potential partners in Topeka uh, to have this access to internet available, especially in this, this new COVID era that we have. Um, yeah, it's it's central to make sure that every student has that access and it's dependable uh, and affordable. And I know we've had uh, partners like Cox and a couple of others, but um, you know, before COVID, it may have been thought of that internet access was just an additional luxury, right? But that no longer is true. It is absolutely necessary. And so I think um, we need to, uh, the board needs to have some strong, take a strong stance on this particular issue, um, find those partners who are willing, I know they're out there, who are willing to sort of um, step up and figure out how do we make this accessible. The, I think it's amazing the, what we've done and creative what we've done to have help our students during this meantime. But for long term, we do need to get serious about this. And Mr. Munoz, are you also referencing then broadband is something that as a community, because without broadband, we really cannot actually adequately serve all of the students as effectively as we'd like. So broadband being an initiative that you want us to continue to be involved in and to promote, is that one uh, of the suggestions? I mean, it's, I, I think it opens up a lots of different doors uh, in terms of getting that, just make sure, making sure everybody has an access, but also begin to make some uh, headway in terms of the inequity that exists among our students. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I would be in favor of figuring out how we can uh, get this uh, rolling. And I think the larger issue for us is to make sure that uh, Topeka understands that this no longer is something that we uh, that's just a uh, luxury. It is essential for students to be successful. So. Yeah, um, Mr. Munoz, um, I noticed that DCAC is having Gina Millsap come and talk to them at their Tuesday meeting. Um, so it may be a good thing for you to go sit in and, and me too, to find out exactly where we are with broadband in Shawnee County. 
Ms. Foley. That, you know, the equity piece that even if we have it available, we'll still have families that can't afford it. So how are we going to be able to support those families? It may be a small number, it may be a larger number, but we need to make sure that we are covering those families as well. And for the board to know, I know Mr. Robbins is joining on Zoom as well, that uh, for the 14,000 students, I think most districts in Kansas uh, likely struggle with this, but I'll speak to Topeka Public Schools. Uh, as a school district, we uh, don't have the ability to provide everybody with paid internet. And that's, I don't know, an expectation that parents have, but we don't have that ability. Ultimately, we will need the community to have broadband services in Topeka as a community. Uh, but absent of that, the short range uh, creativity that we can provide are the mobile hotspots. And not just school parking lots, but the map of all the places that have Wi-Fi on their parking lots. Those are short term, and we recognize those are very much short term. So our advocation will be that as a community, broadband for all families um, would be accessible. So that's you know the structure that we have. I do want to acknowledge uh, Bible uh, Fellowship Bible who reached out because they did not have Sharefest this year, and they are working on a plan to perhaps partner with us to provide some limited uh, continued support for Wi-Fi. And they're not sure what that could look like, but they have uh, reached out. Also, Topeka Community Foundation has reached out to all Shawnee County schools, asked us to prioritize list, which we gave hotspots as one of ours, and internet service as one of our items on our list. So we thank those partners that are stepping up in that fashion, but ultimately broadband will be a necessity. Ms. Stuart Campbell, did you have a question, comment? I did. Um, I, I also just want to say, in addition to all of our families having broadband, there's also the issue of families who don't know how to use a computer or how to use the internet or how to help their kids. So I know I've expressed um, before to some individuals that like some of the immigrant families that I've worked with, even though they had internet, and this is not in TPS, even though they had internet, they did not know how to utilize it, how to help their children. And so our Immigrant population, our English language learners, especially the, the younger ones, um, are really, they're vulnerable. So I just want to keep them in mind. I'm so glad you said that because that was a learning opportunity for us with the uh, mission, the rescue mission, uh, where the students had devices, but none, uh, but the families, many of the families didn't know how to work the computer or they were not literate enough to utilize the directions that were provided with the computer. Therefore, uh, Mrs. Sondrager, the principal at Quincy, uh, went over and gave uh, on-site training. And what we learned from that is that every one of the school's COVID teams could provide parent training on some items that we know parents now need. Uh, when we had to open so quickly, that was uh, really a, a turnaround within a week or two. But now for this year, uh, one of the reasons I want to make sure that every school has their own team, then we can have, uh, as part of that responsibility, what professional development are you going to give to families and what's the schedule and what kind of ongoing way. The other item that we piloted through parents as teachers, which was highly effective, was virtual home visits. And so we will be able to have a staff member go to a home you know, show them virtually, how do you access Zoom, and, and what does that look like? So we'll be doing some of that training on site at schools, and we'll have some um, training of how to have virtual home visit opportunities as well, because many of those were for some of our low-income families, uh, but we had to teach them how to access the virtual device portion first. So thank you for mentioning that. I think this year, with the planning we've done the last two months, we'll be uh, even more sensitive to that over time. Uh, the webinars that we provide and the videos, we now put that on cable channel. We learn from families who didn't know how to access some things. The more videos we put on the cable channel, the better. So we'll be expanding that service to explain how to use some items as well. Moving from digital equity, we have just two more slides. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wallace. Okay, so some of the initial safety precautions that we're looking at are requiring masks, 
um, you know, those school-based uh, COVID teams will help implement their building-based plan, which does include things like the furniture being socially distanced and um, partitions and or plastic dividers that are see-through um, if uh, schools have tables um, so kids aren't uh, within six, if they're within six feet of each other, they have a barrier. Um, touchless thermometers, um, those have all been purchased. Um, signage, both at the entryway, but then also signage in halls on the floor for the six feet distancing when they're in the hallways, as well as signage on walls, including even traffic paths within buildings. Um, so uh, entryways and exits are used, um, and we don't have a lot of uh, students, staff um, crossing paths and they're all going the same direction. Um, additionally, uh, things like um, the school-based uh, scheduling. That, so one of the things that implementation team can do is create some alternate schedules so kids aren't passing at the same times in the hallway. Um, a parent MOU, voluntarily informing schools um, if a student is ill um, due to COVID or has tested positive. Um, isolating, creating an isolation space. The isolation space should have, you know, space should have good ventilation, close to the office, um, close to the nurse, those kinds of things, um, as well as uh, frequent hand washing and actually teaching and training kids on frequent hand washing and uh, everything from um, protocols for using uh, water fountains, equipment, those kinds of things. And then the second um, or the last slide is around uh, behaviors and monitoring behaviors online, particularly um, providing some training for our teachers on behavior management in an online or remote learning environment, maintaining our building mental health teams and them assessing uh, high needs or vulnerable students it was one of the things that was very successful. Um, the last quarter of the year was that the mental health teams at each building um, came up with a list of vulnerable students and had weekly check-ins with those students to ensure that the families had what they needed um, and that their mental health was in a good place and to provide opportunities for additional services. Um, uh, positive parent phone calls home, um, it really encouraging and promoting that engagement and then um, parent meetings being virtual as opposed to having large gatherings. So, and providing, again, some of that training opportunity for parents, but also um, any of the, the programming or evening parent meetings that we have can be virtual. Um, and then, you know, monitoring our, our discipline data closely and um, implementing our CI3T model in a hybrid or remote way. So with all of those items, uh, the resources and upcoming webinars, there are tons of resources and that's in our plan. But just to give you a few, we thank uh, uh, our board members who so closely watch CUBE. So Mrs. Stuart Campbell sent a link this evening to one of the webinars about reopening. That is linked here for board members who may have missed seeing that. We also have ASCD has a virtual conference. I know I'll be participating in that about how to respond, reimagine, and restart. But there are other individuals there. You already know of our equity uh, council is continuing to do those equity conversations and we'll be doing that all year long just to get feedback and to talk about equity and there are a few other articles there. At the very bottom is the survey. So board members again when we send this PowerPoint and we send the survey we just invite that feedback for you to share with us what you'd like to see change or add it. Here's one addition to the survey. Uh, at this time we do know that the COVID-19 um, uh, cases are rising, and as a result of those rising cases, one of the questions on the survey includes, uh, given the rise in cases, uh, if uh, we will be asking the comfortability of our staff and of our parents of uh, continuing the virtual format for first quarter as one option, and for those families that truly need child care that uh, need that immediately uh, when August uh, returns, 
uh, for the district to look at ways to help make that happen, but allowing for first quarter to begin on virtual as one option. We're asking for parent and staff feedback on comfortability of that along with many of the other options. Uh, based on the results that we get by Wednesday, we'll be sharing that with the board so you get a good feel of where parents are and if they are in a place in which they feel and staff that they uh, are safe to return and if they would prefer to see a virtual start as a soft launch with some uh, limited uh, opportunities beyond that. We're going to open this up for overall questions beyond what we've already shared. And um, the entire team that's here is prepared to answer any of the questions you may have. We we'll work under the assumption that the more perspectives, the more voices we can get in, um, that the closer we'll get to a potential you know outcome a plan a solution that'll be sort of on the mark the best track and so I just uh, as we have a very short turnaround for this survey I want to push our, us to try and think of outside of the box of ways that we can get responses to surveys because I my sense is that we get surveys all the time you know in, in at work and in and on, on local community organizations doing work and so I, my hope is that we can get as many, um, you know, perspectives from teachers, from our parents. They all have a lot at stake, not, not just themselves, but their kids and, and those who are going to work. And so um, I want to push us to think of different ways, new ways maybe we haven't yet um, reached out to, to individuals who can share with us what, uh, what are their concerns, what are, what are they most worried about. Um, because I think that, that'll help a lot to, to make it away in terms of making sure to once we land on a particular path that we're all, you know, we've all felt like uh, that we've been heard, that everybody feels like, uh, like their, their two cents was, was included and that it's valuable. The, the individuals feel like we, should, we, we do value everybody's participation. So, but that can only happen if we do everything within our power to make sure that the survey and people's input is included. So I just want to challenge us to think about what else can we do that we haven't thought of yet. We do want to mention to board members that the parent feedback form will be a repeat of the survey questions. Um, so if someone says, I just don't want to fill out the survey or I, I don't have the skill set or internet, we want to encourage you and others to recommend that they call in to the parent feedback session as well. But that verbal session will also be some of the repeat questions. If you hear some redundancy, it's intentional. These are certainly uncertain times, and it sounds like the administration has really taken the bull by the horns in many aspects. I'm, have we done testing for the effectiveness of our virtual learning? Have we been able to do that? I'm concerned that our kids are going to lose a year of social interaction and effective learning. Back 30 years ago, air conditioning wasn't in all the schools and their publicity made it so that we got air conditioning in the schools. And I wonder if broadband couldn't be sort of brought about as we need this as a basic necessity. And I wonder about social distancing on buses that mean the buses will have to run twice as twice the routes and carry half the children uh, there were several hundred families that did not want school in person they wanted the virtual do we know why and that's I'm wondering on this survey could we have reasons why they decide yes or no or what direction and i'm also wondering is it possible michigan has changed the fall and spring sports you're not going to socially distance with football ain't no way well it'd be interesting 
but the spring sports, you know, tennis, track, golf, swimming in the winter, but I wonder if it might be a statewide possibility to switch those sports around. I, I'm just worried about all this social distancing of our children, because that's part of maturing and growing up and developing. It just worries me. Regarding the buses, uh, within, and again, I invite uh, individual uh, board members uh, for the plan that is drafted at this time that is waiting for the KSDE and the health department guidelines. We know from the CDC that social distancing on buses and in classrooms and masks being required are a fact at this time. Therefore, we will be requiring masks. We will be social distancing on buses and uh, that may have an impact routes as they're done that will be done with that in mind and masks will be required to be worn. Uh, the district will be providing masks inside of schools uh, but again the details and the level of detail will be further outlined in that report. Um, so based on what we know from the CDC absent of our own uh, community having their finalized report uh, we have planned really based on that along with our staff that's on the KSDE committee but primarily using the CDC so we share with you the same concerns about how do we make sure we still socialize and uh, but remain distant and uh, a great deal of creativity will be uh, deployed but the buses that is a piece that Mr. Robbins is currently addressing with the bus company and they have their CDC guidelines that they have to comply with. Mr. Robbins do you want to add anything about buses sir? Even his. Just that, uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, from what we know now, uh, based on information that we received from Kansas Central, you know, we have 100 buses uh, that Kansas Central has to uh, support uh, their service to uh, Topeka Public Schools. Those 100 buses are used uh, for approximately 79 different routes. If you look at the normal seating that is uh, currently uh, provided by them, we furnish transportation for about 4,400 students on a daily basis. Uh, based on what we know right now, if we had to provide seating uh, based on what could be uh, uh, restricted, uh, in order to provide proper social distancing. Uh, right now, we're estimating that that capacity would be reduced from about 4,400 kids per day down to 1,900 kids per day. So a significant drop in capacity uh, when it comes to transportation, uh, you know, less than 50% uh, of the kids we'd be able to transport uh, if we had to go to one uh, uh, kid per seat, uh, the capacity would reduce even further. Uh, if we had to do further social distancing than that. Uh, so, you know, depending on what sort of guidelines we finally end up with, uh, it could significantly reduce our capacity for transporting kids uh, via bus service uh, on a daily basis. So, um, Reverend Williams, I, um, I have a couple of questions um, um, to piggyback on to um, um, Dr. Bonebreak. I, I did hear a Kashuk guy say that that it was not going to happen that we would switch um, seasons. So um, I think that's already been broached and uh, or, uh, talked about and, and uh, decided not. My question uh, besides <laughs> athletics, which um, I don't see how football players can remain social distance, but is um, art, the arts. I mean, um, we have, this board for a long period of time has been, um, ha has had arts 
the arts as a very important part. Um, I'm thinking that uh, um, we won't be able to do vocal music for the first semester. I just don't see how that can happen um, unless it's remotely um, and one-on-one. -on -one. The other thing is band music, which um, uh, has a lot of spit and things like that going through it. Um, string instruments certainly uh, is a possibility, but um, I, I, I don't know that anybody's thought about these things, but um, it is very important to me. And I think to the board, um, it should be important to the board as well. Um, and the only other thing, <laughs> with Dr. Bonebrick, I'm very concerned about uh, how much the students are learning. Um, I, I think there's a, a chance that some kids just tune it out completely and some parents don't keep the kids tuned in. So um, I think some way we've got to make sure the kids are learning, whether that's through testing and of course, uh, attendance is, is very important too. So that's my two cents. Within our uh, plan, when you see the final plan, you'll see the assessments, the standardized assessments that we give when they very first start school. We anticipate, as we've done in the past, giving that assessment to see how much of a gap there is from when they left to when they return. We also have created assessments, and we did this prior to COVID, uh, the weekly uh, formative, common formative assessments by grade level and by school. That's already electronic. It's already available because we've been using one-to-one -one technology in online assessments since that's the way the state gives their assessments. So those are available as check-in points uh, to determine the level of um, a mastery weekly and monthly and at other checkpoints. Uh, we did give, uh, we did have students participate in music, even creatively, as you've just heard, PE. And while we would like to see all students in the room together with their instruments, absent of doing that, we do have a creative plan to be able to do that, as we've done at the last three months. Ms. Wallace, do you want to speak to that? Um, correct. So in the spring, we did offer music, general music classes at the elementary, and then the ongoing music classes students were enrolled in at the secondary. And so some of that was done through live Zoom lessons. Others were done with pre-recorded video lessons. Um, and then the ability for kids, um, we have the technology for kids to be able to use um, applications like Flipgrid and or um, videotaping themselves with their iPads and then airdropping them to their teachers. So there is a way for them to share their performance pieces um, with their teachers. And then even during summer school, we offered um, theater, which is a performing arts piece um, virtually. And while it's not exactly the same thing, um, there are a lot of things that they can do theater related um, and music related virtually. And then when we get them back in the classroom, um, we will get them interacting. Okay, thank, thank you. That's very reassuring. Any more questions, comments? Um, I'm thinking about all of the parents who can't be there, who have to go to work, and are the littles. So, and what, what can we do for them? So let's say we're entirely virtually or because it has to be that way or on days when they just have to be, they can't be in brick and mortar. What are options for, for those kids? Well, at this time, uh, you know, we hope that all of our children, particularly our, our youngest learners, can be in school. Uh, that's the hope. But absent of that, if we need to implement a hybrid model or uh, an um, virtual remote model based on parent choice, which they have actually put reasons, the parents, as to why they prefer virtual. Um, but if we have to do either of those, Mrs. Sharp can talk a little bit about, from an elementary perspective, um, you know, some of the things that uh, we can do. And just to make sure we understand the question, mm -hmm. if a parent 
have to go to work. Um, I guess your question is uh, regarding virtual learning, what will that look like? Right, so I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, a, a kindergartner who cannot be in the brick and mortar building and just because it's just, it's not available because of COVID. It's just not an option for just thinking about what could happen in the future and parents, have to go to work so of course we can't leave the, the child home unsupervised so I'm thinking of I'm really thinking of child care I mean of course education too but is that something that we can we can help the families out with well in this space at this time it would be difficult to say that we can uh, confidently provide child care without knowing um, what teachers are willing to come back without knowing some of the other uh, factors that would impact that. But providing that instructional classroom setting is the desire, and that's what we want to work towards. Uh, if, in fact, right now, as COVID numbers increase and we can't open, or we parents would like to see us delaying opening, uh, we certainly want to explore how can we provide small group settings and other instructional opportunities. Um, but for the most part, uh, I think this challenge for all of us has been parents uh, have been impacted in terms of work with students being out. Mrs. Sharp, do you want to add anything regarding elementary as it relates to uh, when kindergartners are home and others, either one, instructionally how that's addressed and even preschool as you oversee that, uh, what you foresee as options since you were on the planning committee? Yeah. Um. I know that many of the families were sending their kiddos to daycare during the day. I know sometimes we had daycare providers or grandmas or grandpas helping kids do those assignments. I think when we um, load interactive activities into Seesaw that that will also provide a little more leeway when the activities can be done or completed. I think um, we could also look at what kind of supports could maybe be provided outside of the traditional school. That would be something different than we had done uh, previously. Anything else? Well, how are uh, our social workers and our counselors? How are they preparing for this upcoming school year? No, we know that we're not. Uh, we don't have any definite plan, right? But what are the what are the core things that they're they're thinking of and, and ruminating about uh, in order to help support our students? Because it's it's a difficult time for all of us, uh, for parents, but also for our kids. Well, um, we do have counselors who are planning and preparing um, lessons, uh, just social emotional um, counseling lessons that they would normally provide. But we also um, are pulling together social workers and counselors for a small kind of reentry, uh, mental health, social emotional. We, we know that being at home and not having the socialization and being able to go out um, to all of the different places that they might normally go out um, has created some anxiety for kids and there may be anxiety about returning to school as well. So they are working on re-entry lessons to do with families and to do with kids. Oh, and we, yeah, we're very fortunate that Mallory Jacobs, one of our counselors, is on the implementation team for KSDE. So she's been a part of the state planning. And so as soon as that's released, and we were kind of all promised to be confidential about it, as soon as that's kind of lifted, then um, she can share even more deeply with the rest of the counselors and really get busy on that. That concludes our report, and uh, we look forward to uh, a, uh, a very good year ahead, uh, given all that we are faced with right now. We are particularly excited about the planning team and uh, the addition of the associate superintendent to help us manage uh, this uh, tremendous Herculean challenge that we feel uh, we will uh, address um, in the best possible way. Uh, the only other item that I will add to this is that uh, this evening's PowerPoint uh, we certainly will make available uh, so that people can begin to see that 
uh, the, the planning has been ongoing and all the individuals involved and some of the things, safety precautions and things that will be taking place. The survey will go out Friday night. It will be due back Wednesday, but anyone who doesn't want to, a teacher or parent, fill it out. They certainly can come to the feedback verbal session on Monday or Tuesday, and we will continue to keep our board uh, updated. So, Dr. Anderson, um, those those meetings on Monday and Tuesday will there be a spot for virtual people as well, or is it on Facebook, or what? It, how how is that done? That will be both. So it's a Zoom uh, spot, and so when we send this out to the board, um, I believe Mr. Gowan on team will be helping with uh, and communications team will be helping with getting that Zoom link out for DCAC, and, uh, but Zoom, of course, has the phone number call in for those that don't have internet. So if they'd like to just call in, they will be able to do that. Uh, so certainly, uh, we will be Facebook living that. So those that would prefer just to be on Facebook Live, that certainly will be the option. And we will be recording that uh, so that those that would like to go back and watch it later, uh, that's yet a third option. How about I take a picture of the paperwork that we have here? It has a Zoom connection to it, and I will text that to you so that you can have that information to enter that, that Zoom meeting. Sharon, you just sent it to Dr. Morrison. So if you uh, check, Dr. Gray has sent you the PowerPoint and the Zoom link uh, to participate on Monday. It's also on our social media sites for those that are listening that want to know and how, how to uh, sign in as well. Remind me again, whatever, however we decide to move forward, what is the date that we school will plan to be open? Teachers report back on August 5th and the first day of school for um, kindergarten through 5th, 6th and 9th is August 12th and then all students on the 13th. Um, new staff orientation starts on August 27th. Oh, sorry, July 27th. Oh. And um, something a little bit different because we're doing it uh, new staff orientation virtually. We're starting it on the 27th, but they really, you know, typically it's been a four day new staff orientation. Um, but because it's virtual, it will um, remain open and available to them, all of the training sessions and opportunities um, through the start of the school year so that they can revisit those. Next item of business, we have one discussion item. That is pre calculus textbook resource. I think that is uh, Ms. Stella Cruz available. I mean, I'm welcome to speak to it as well. So um, they put together a committee to look at a new pre calc trig textbook. And so the request is um, to have, if there's discussion about um, the textbook that they've selected, and then next time, action. So we ask that the board allow us to proceed forward with calculus books for the upcoming year. We need them. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I need to, to see the books to see, make sure I can still do it all. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a seat. Just kidding, just kidding. Brings us to board member comments, uh, starting with Ms. Stuart Campbell. Yeah, okay, so I want to commend the district's efforts for this COVID-19 reopening. It's huge and just looks really, it looks good. I can see so much effort, so much planning, and of course, it's ongoing. So thank you for all of that. Um, I also wanted to say that I was lucky and I attended virtually, of course, the uh, June 23rd equity panel that Dr. Anderson participated in. And our former board member, Patrick Woods, was one of the facilitators. 
and that was uh, it was really 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 good and it, just a very rich discussion and I'm glad that our our district is involved in this very important conversation happening across our nation thinking about the protests and raising awareness and just the very problem uh, facing our nation about implicit bias and systemic racism and how things have just really got to improve. So I'm uh, grateful that we have Dr. Anderson at the helm to guide to Pika Public Schools, which is, as we all know, the very epicenter of the of school desegregation. So and also just to intensify TPS's efforts to recruit more teachers of color and to ensure that our curriculum includes ample opportunities for our students to not only be as informed as possible, but to be anti-racist. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm just... I'm glad we have you, Dr. Anderson, um, leading our district because this is this is this is it's very important. I'm going to echo Miss uh, uh, her her comments, uh, my colleague. Um, we have an extremely capable uh, team up and down. Uh, wherever you look in our in 501, you have individuals who really care. About our district and care about our kids and go 110 percent and, and the extra effort to make sure that uh, we're doing this best job that we can uh, for our students despite these difficult times and so I'm, uh, I'm appreciative of everybody's efforts thank you all um, my only comment would be uh, that uh, there, there are no experts in this particular situation we find ourselves in you know, there are experts in, in the area of health and there are experts in the area of uh, education, but this particular uh, COVID-19 and how we move forward, um, they're, they're, we just nobody has experienced this before. So I think what's most important about this particular situation um, is making sure that we have as many voices included in this process as possible. Um, there is understandably lots of apprehension on, on the parts of uh, our families and um, should kids, you know, go to school or should they stay home and what should I do? Uh, it's understandable, and I think it's coming upon us to hear those concerns and to to recognize it and, and highlight that, lift that up as very real, uh, and uh, and try and figure out how we can move forward. And also, there's recognition that uh, teachers are also, you know, in a very difficult situation. So listening to them and making sure that they feel that we are uh, absolutely value their input and and, and their concerns are very real. Um, and, and if we can do that, if we can figure out how to how to reach as many um, voices as possible, um, put all of those uh, concerns to get together and, and address it in a way I think we can come out of this uh, in a stronger position uh, because we were pushed to, with the circumstance. So I hope that uh, we hear lots of voices and, and everybody um, sends us their input. We're eager, I'm eager to, to hear what everybody has to say and, uh, and being able to put up together a plan here in the next couple of weeks that uh, helps us uh, come out of this stronger. Thank you. I'd like to uh, welcome Joe Hackett to our family. Welcome back. We are excited to have you. And of course, you can understand it's an important time to have as much help and knowledge as we can have. So we appreciate you accepting that position. Um, I also want to. I hope this meeting helped our community understand that their children and their families are foremost in our thoughts and our planning, the safety and their education. And um, we really encourage each person in the district possible to give us your feedback because your feedback is important to guiding us. And so we hope you participate in those surveys and any call-ins. Um, the Zoom meetings, please, please give us your information and your concerns because we understand this is a coronavirus is serious and we want to protect your children and your feedback helps us. 
Um, also, I want to be very excited about our graduation. I hope we can do it. A little bit of normalcy for our seniors. How exciting is that? I'm really looking forward to that graduation. So how wonderful is it to have a little piece of normalcy for our um, school community? Also, I was wondering at next meeting, if it would be at all possible to hear some explanation about how we are going to possibly help catch our students up. We've lost some ground for many of our students. I was hoping that maybe somewhere in an explanation of how is our district going to support these students and so the families know that we want to try to do our best to cover that. Just appreciate all the work that you've done and I'm excited to hear the final plan. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bomberg. And I wish again to express my appreciation to the administration but also the addition. We now have someone with considerable experience with year-round schools, and I think this may be a, at least a partial solution to any educational lag. The United States was number one in international testing 30, 40 years ago. I think we're 30 to 40 in the world now. We're no longer an agrarian society. And I really think need to get to year round. I have a niece who teaches in Germany uh, secondary English and phys ed. She makes $70,000 after taxes every year. She works 10 and a half months a year and Saturday mornings in addition to weekdays. Um, there's just another way of doing it. And those, her education is just short of a PhD, as are probably 90% of all German teachers. And I think we need to help promote our teachers. At last meeting, we had 16 uh, teachers who entered the master's program. And I think every one of them, their goal was become an administrator. Well, that wasn't the goal I had in mind, just to be a better teacher. My stepdaughter uh, was a kid teacher, and she worked the ten and a half months a year, Saturdays, every day of the week, 7 to 5 p.m., and moved these students up four grade levels. And they were 99% of them poverty and single parent, or if any parent. So I, I appreciate Dr. Hackett's presence. Maybe we can all learn something. That's all. Thank you. Dr. Morrison. Yes, sir. I have uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, piggyback off of uh, Mr. Munoz said that the, the situation we have now is very fluid. We Things may change. We may plan one way and have to change mid-cycle just like, uh, uh, <laughs> like we did at spring break. So we have to have a lot of patience. We have to listen to um, parents. We have to listen to teachers. Uh, it can be very dangerous for teachers to be exposed. Um, tonight I'm remote because my daughter has COVID-19. Um, she was positive and has uh, symptoms. Um, she today is feeling somewhat better. So uh, my wife and I are self-quarantined till next week sometime. Um, so it's a real thing um, and people are dying over 50,000 cases today in the United States. So we, we have to watch what's going on. And Dr. Anderson, I think is right in the middle of that, listening to the health department, 
and waiting for, for um, uh, Department of Education. The other thing that's a little concerning to me is our facilities, Hummer Sports Park, is going to let the Shriner football game be played in, I think, about 10 days or something like that. This is a <laughs> football game with athletes from around the state. These kids, and it is outdoors, these kids are going to be in um, practicing in some facilities. I don't know ex exactly which ones. But the interesting thing to me is they're allowed to play football, but the bands aren't going to be allowed to come and perform. So I'm, I'm, uh, it, it just very, it bothers me a lot, um, especially when athletics and uh, is so much more important than the arts. Um, it, it bothers me a lot. I, I, I know we've signed a contract, um, and I, uh, Mr. Robbins, I think, might be, uh, or, well, actually it was Mr. Dick that um, um, looked into that. So I might just ask Mr. Kathy that if he could reassure me that um, that's going to be safe for these kids to come from all over the state to <laughs> get on a football field and play football. I know that the Shrine are probably responsible for it, but it's on our facility. So um, a food for thought. So that's all I have. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Morrison, I've, I've been uh, speaking with uh, the gentleman that's in charge of the Shrine Bowl and they are making, they're doing everything they can to ensure the student athletes are in, are safe and are going to be healthy. Um, they are, they've putting no more than 25 kids on a bus and they will be taking them to Shawnee Heights and Washburn Rules, the practice facilities they'll be using during that week. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> but I, I just want you to know that uh, one kid has asymptomatic and, and infects five or six kids. Um, we're going to hear about it, I'm afraid. So just, just my thinking. I, I understand everybody's <laughs> uh, doing the best they can. But my, my only question is, should they do it? I, to answer your question, honestly, is I don't know. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I'm not asking you to answer it. <laughs> so, but it is a concern from a, from a medical point. Thank you. Um, just want to uh, second all of the uh, comments made by my colleagues uh, without restating and also again welcome Dr. Hackett back to big public schools. Um, and I hope and pray that everybody practice uh, safety over the 4th of July weekend and see you next Thursday, I believe, correct? Any other business comments before the board this evening? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>